Well, Jesus had recently lost a really good friend, had tried to take a little vacation and had crowds following him, was moved with compassion as Jesus often was when he saw the crowds. He decided to invest and spend an entire day teaching and healing among the people, even though he had every reason from our perspective not to chose to feed the crowd at the end of the day because he saw that they were hungry, looked at one of his disciples who should know better, should trust him and know that he could do anything and, and said to Philip, how are we gonna feed these people? And Philip said, no way, we can't do it. So there was a little discouragement there probably from Jesus. Jesus was testing him and Philip failed. He looked at the rest of his disciples and said, how are we gonna solve this problem? And Andrew went out into the crowd with the other disciples and came back with a little boy with some crackers and sardines. And he said, I don't have much, but this is all I have. And Jesus said, it's enough. And then the Bible says something in John chapter six, that's very subtle, but very important. And I wanna look at that with you right now. Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down, about 5,000 men were there and probably 15 to 20,000 women and children. Jesus then took the loaves and he gave thanks. He was thankful in spite of the fact that he was tired, in spite of the fact that he was grieving, in spite of the fact that he had friends who didn't have a lot of confidence in him, in spite of the fact that it was inconvenient, probably better times to be bothered by the crowds, yet he looked up into heaven and he gave thanks. He didn't give thanks because the timing was good, the circumstances were all lined up and everything was going the way that everyone wanted it to go. He gave thanks because God was who he was, that he was in charge, that his plan was coming into being, that the disciples were part of it, that a crowd was being fed, but he gave thanks before the miracle even happened. So I wanna to talk to you about thanks in the Bible. First of all, I wanna just ask you to get started with me, uh, just to prime the pump, and I want you to look at me, and I don't want you to say it to me, but I want you to say it in my direction. I just want you to say it out loud. Um, I just want you to say the words, thank you, okay? I know you're not thanking me. Um, you're just saying it this direction because it's weird if you look at the person next to you and say it. But let's just say, thank you. Ready? Thank you. One, I'll go to three. How about that? One, two, three. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, because of who you are. Thank you, God, because you're perfect, holy, loving, and merciful and kind. Thank you, God, because you always keep your promises. Thank you, God, because your plan involves me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you is mentioned in the Bible a bunch of times, and some of the times they're kind of random. In the New Testament, about 73 times thank you was mentioned. Only 20 of those times occurred in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And out of that 20, only seven times, Jesus was recorded saying, thank you. I was thinking about thank you in the Old Testament. Maybe you remember some Old Testament stories. Do you remember Daniel? Anybody remember Daniel? Raise your hands if you remember Daniel. Maybe uh, if you're not a churchy like me, you didn't grow up in church, maybe you've heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den where Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and the lions didn't eat him because God miraculously closed their mouth or clo closed their mouths. This story that I'm thinking of occurred before Daniel was in the lion's den, actually led up to this. And Daniel was in a time when the government was outlawing Christianity or worshiping the one true God in Daniel's day. They were prohibiting prayer to anybody except the king or the emperor. And Daniel three times a day knelt in prayer. And what he did when he prayed was he said, thank you. And the Bible specifically records that he knelt three times a day to say thanks in an environment where people wanted to kill him for exercising his faith. I thought about Jonah. Anybody remember Jonah? Where was Jonah? Well, he was a lot of places, I guess, but in the whale is the place where we think about Jonah the most. And um, Jonah was in the whale because he chose to disobey God. You may remember the story. He wanted to go to the opposite direction that God wanted him to go because he didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. A storm came. He ended up being thrown overboard of the ship. A whale swallowed Jonah. Jonah was in the bottom of a whale. And in Jonah chapter two, a prayer is recorded. And what do you think Jonah said? To God. What do you think Jonah said to God? Thank you. It's okay. You can talk back to me today. Thank you to God from the belly of a whale. The New Testament, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, we find in the middle of a storm, 
on his way to prison with a bunch of people who wanted him dead and a shipwreck was imminent. We see after about two weeks of turmoil and trouble in the worst possible circumstances, the apostle Paul stopped, called the people around him together. And what do you think he did? He said to God, thank you. Unbelievable. Thank you throughout scripture. King David was one of the most thankful people in all of the Bible, but lived one of the most tumultuous lives. But then when I look at Jesus, I think Jesus saying thank you must be pretty significant. Let's take a deep dive and figure out when and why he did what he did. So Jesus was recorded only seven times praying a prayer of thank you. The first two times were similar in theme. And that was when he was thanking God the Father for concealing truth from people who would abuse the truth and revealing truth to people who wanted the truth. At that time, Jesus prayed this prayer, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Thank you, God, for not revealing truth to people who want to build a religion that benefits themselves, to become more judgmental, haughty, and proud, more exclusive. Thank you for revealing truth to people who are humble and know they need you people who have childlike faith, like me and like you, like us. Prayed it two times. The next three times that Jesus is recorded praying a prayer of thank you were in miracles. The first miracle we see before feeding the 4,000. That's not what we're talking about today, but he prayed a prayer of thank you. The second miracle was when he prayed a prayer of thank you during the feeding of the 5,000, which was what we're talking about today. The third time that Jesus is recorded praying a prayer of thank you is when he prayed a prayer of thank you before Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now, I love the fact that when Jesus prayed, he prayed thank you before the miracle. Because you have to decide, and so do I, are we gonna be people who are thankful before God does what it is that we want him to do or because God who he is and he's chosen to love and to relate to us because of what we get or because of who God is. The last two times were times that it occurred very quickly, closely together. They were in times of significant, significant historical and Christian significance, importance, and also distress. The last days before Jesus left his disciples, was arrested, tried, and crucified. He prayed a prayer of thank you at the beginning of what was the customary meal that accompanied getting together to celebrate the Passover. It was a foreshadowing of everything changing. Then Jesus broke bread in the Last Supper and prayed a prayer of thanks because everything was gonna change and he was gonna pay the price for sin, allowing us to have a personal relationship with him. Thank you because of who God is, not just because of what he does. So what do we say thank you for or about? God is omniscient. He knows everything, nothing surprises him. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere and through the Holy Spirit connects with us and has a personal relationship with us. He's all powerful, but there's nothing that he can't do. And so you and I have to choose our philosophy or our perspective in life and we have to decide that we're gonna be thankful because God is who he is, not just because of what we want him to do. We have to be thankful before he does the miracles in our lives or answers the requests that we may have because that's a life of uncommon faith. And it frees us from the trap of entitlement and self-focus. So how does God wanna be thanked? There are at least three ways. The first one you see in John chapter six, where Jesus said, thank you. He wants a prayer of thanks. 
And you and I oftentimes pray thank you to God, but we need to be careful, I think, how we pray. And we see Jesus doing it when he took the loaves and gave thanks because God the Father was going to reveal power in the gospel to a crowd who desperately needed to have a miracle. Maybe you need a miracle in your life. Maybe you're running from God. Maybe you need the truth revealed in a way that gets your attention. Maybe today's the day. Sometimes we get very superficial in our prayer of thanks. We thank God for the food, ask him to bless it to our bodies. When in reality, a lot of times what we eat isn't even blessable. We tell him, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for giving us this, God. Thank you for the promotion. Thanks for the new car. Thanks that my kids got the scholarship. Thanks that we, those are all good things to thank God for. But we're talking about something so much deeper here. An attitude that empowers us to free ourselves from the inward focused kind of existence that we were born living. And a prayer of thanks connects and reminds us that God is who he is and that he still chooses to love us and that in spite of what's going on circumstantially in our lives, it's right to be thankful. The second thing may surprise you. And the second thing is that we give an offering of thanks. King David says, I'll sacrifice a voluntary offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. In Psalm 50, he says, these people honor me, God says, who bring me offerings to show thanks. And I, God, will save those who do that. So we say things to God when we're thankful, but we also offer things to God when we're thankful. My pastor growing up said that it's possible to give to something or someone without loving them, but impossible to love someone without choosing to give to them. Jesus talks oftentimes about where our heart is, there our treasure is, where our treasure is, there our heart is. And one of the ways that we show God that we're thankful is by giving. And giving oftentimes requires sacrifice. I have two boys, I talk about them all the time. Richard and Nathan, two good ones. And um, Richard, my oldest, when he was getting engaged, I'll never forget this, he wanted to buy an engagement ring. That's a good thing to do when you get engaged, you buy an engagement ring, which signals your intentions. Um, and uh, I think women like it, I don't know. They like to have the engagement ring. And so Richard has always been sort of business oriented, kind of frugal. Um, I would say cheap, but that's not a really nice thing to say about your own family. Selectively cheap, how about that? And I asked Richard if I could tell this story, so he's probably watching this morning online to make sure I'm telling it accurately. Richard at the time had a Jeep and he was gonna purchase seat covers for his Jeep. And uh, seat covers for his Jeep, they were a really expensive brand called Bartact and they were gonna be about 750 bucks. That's a lot of money, but for Richard, that was a good purchase because after all, it was a Jeep. Now, he was getting engaged at the same time and he came to me with an engagement ring idea that did not cost as much as his seat covers. Now, it does not matter how much an engagement ring costs. It doesn't matter. It can be ginormous, it can be tiny, it doesn't matter. But the principle behind it should be sacrifice, right? And I said to Richard, you cannot buy your fiance a wedding ring that costs less than your seat covers. I will not allow it. It should hurt a little bit. I was like, why? It's sacrifice. It shows your commitment. And so he went the opposite direction, <laughs> leveraged everything he had. He was selling stuff. He bought an engagement ring that I'm like, I didn't mean that, Richard. But Eden was proud of it. And it cost him. And it was sacrifice because he loved her. And it's what you do. We give God love offerings. I don't hear everything that goes on in city groups, but I hear some things. And in our city groups this last time, last week, we were talking in staff meeting and, and I think that you guys are sort of tracking with me on this 10 for 10 thing. Because the 10 for 10, when I ask you guys to give $10, if you've never given 10 bucks to the Lord for 10 weeks, if you've given 10 or money to the Lord, your offerings give $10 more to stretch a little bit. 
um, that there's a principle behind it. And you know, with our big budget here at the church, that me asking you to give $10 per week for 10 weeks isn't gonna solve our financial problems. It's not gonna to pay the bills. You know, it all goes you know, towards something great. We're investing. But in the city group, this conversation or discussion, as was related to me, was that, you know, it, it's clear that Pastor Rick's not asking for this because it benefits the church. What's clear is that Pastor Rick is asking for this because it benefits us that if we start doing this, that God's gonna do things in our lives that are gonna surprise us and that obedience brings blessing. And that's exactly why I want you to do it. Because one of the ways that we show God that we're thankful is by giving him offerings. And we give him sacrificial offerings. And sometimes the amount's small and sometimes the amount's big depending on how God has blessed us. But a sacrifice always hurts just a little bit. And literally, when we offer ourselves through our love offerings to the Lord, we're saying, I trust you more with what I care about most. And I trust you'll take care of me, even though what I'm giving you, I used to take care of me. And it's one of the ultimate demonstrations of faith. Last week on Tuesday, Kathy, our administrative assistant, showed me an envelope. And somebody dropped it in the offering plate. I don't count the offering. We have a finance team that does that. And I get to see things like this sometimes, but not what you guys put in the offering plate, of course. But this envelope Kathy gave me. And we were talking last week about not having much, but giving what we have and trusting God to do a lot with a little. And this isn't the first time I've heard a story like this from one of you guys, but this is the first time it was ever written down since we've started the 10 for 10. And so I assume this is a lady because the penmanship is stellar and um, maybe that's gender biased, but I look like I, I write after having an injury to my hand and poor vision. Um, and this is great penmanship. So I assume it's a lady and she dropped this in the, in the box last Sunday, this was everything that I had in my lunchbox. And it says 57 bucks on there. You may be in here today, I don't know. I don't know who you are. And then I want you to look down here at the bottom where it says special. And do you see what's written there? Thank you. Now she's not thanking me, just like you didn't thank me a minute ago. She's thanking God because of who he is and because he's trustworthy. And she was giving a sacrificial offering of praise. My guess is if this is all you have, things have probably not gone as well as you would have hoped in recent history financially. And let me confess to you something. This is how basic I get sometimes. When Kathy handed me this envelope, my first thought was, I've got to find out who this is and I've got to make sure I take care of them because they just gave their last 57 bucks to the Lord through the church. And then I stepped back, it hit me like a lightning. I even said this in front of the staff. That's how, that's how, I mean, it was one of those things where it hit me and I thought, where is my faith? God increase my faith. I don't have to take care of this lady because she gave faithfully to you. She's demonstrated the principles that we've been talking about for the last month plus and is literally trusting you and able to say thank you. And I said this prayer, God, thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this woman's life. And I have no idea if you're here and what God is doing, but I can promise you with this kind of uncommon faith, God has your back. So the two ways so far that we thank God are by telling him thank you in a prayer and by giving him thanks in an offering. But the third way, I don't love because it's just not the way I'm wired. I should love it because it's biblical. And King David demonstrated it over and over and over again, but it's singing thanks. Thanks. 
we say thanks, we give thanks, and we sing thank you. Now, I've told you that, you know, I, I enjoy singing. I like it when you sing. I don't like to sing. I've never been a good singer. After I had my thyroid surgery and they took out my thyroid and nicked my vocal cords, the doctor stole my high notes. And so now I can't really, you know, I have no. And, and so, you know, for me, I enjoy it, but I wouldn't just say, you know, I just want to sing my praise to God. I'm going to wake up in the morning with a song to the Lord. Um, I'm not wired that way. Somebody, people like Ashley is certainly wired that way, right? You probably sing your praises to the Lord every morning, don't you? I do. I love music. Yeah. And I'm fortunate. I had, um, growing up, I had a mom who taught me all about the importance of music and what it meant to God. And so I've been very fortunate and it's part of how I worship. So King David actually says, sing your thanks to the Lord, sing praises to God with a harp. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. But did you know, and this is kind of what surprised me, um, that God sings songs over us. You knew that? I did know you that. would know that, Thanks, wouldn't Mom. you? Yep. Who, how did you know that? Thanks, Mom. <laughs> your mom told you. Yeah, grow, so growing up, your mom talked to you about God singing over you. Is that a weird thought for you? Have you ever thought about that? You ever visualized that, that God sings songs about you and over you? And as we sing our songs to him, I think it's safe to say that's God's love language. I would agree. Uh, and so we're gonna sing our thanks to God because we've already had a time where we've talked about giving our thank offerings to God. We've already prayed together and we've told the Lord, thank you. So let's demonstrate it in this very real way. Let's sing together and let's not worry about who's next to us or in front of us or who can hear us. Let's sing songs to God, songs of thanksgiving, songs of praise because it's God's love language and he's created us to be people who are thankful. So regardless of what's going on in life, whether you're waiting for a blessing or a miracle, whether you're going through difficult times, whether you're struggling, we still say thank you because of God, his love, because of his character, because of his plan, and because it's right. So stand with me, please. Let's sing these songs together and thank you to the Lord. Gratitude is not circumstantial that thank you doesn't depend on us getting what we think we want or deserve in life. I remember learning this at a young age. I was at a church in Africa, in Uganda, and I was in a worship service and I was listening to a group of people sing who looked like they had absolutely nothing in the entire world to be thankful for. They didn't have any money, they didn't have any health care, they didn't know where their next meal was coming from, their future, who knows, their country, beyond volatile. And they sang a song of thanks. And I still remember it in Swahili, even though it's been years ago. They sang, Atana Kefa Natatawalatena. And then they sang, Hallelujah, thank you. So I finally asked our translator after it was over what that means. And what he said is, it means thank you to God. Because even if we die, we still will live. Atana Kefa, Natata Walatena. Thank you to God, even though the circumstances in my life aren't what I think I deserve or what I think I want. Thank you to God because you're God and you're worthy of thanks. My thanksgiving is not determined by circumstance. It's not determined by my optimism or my pessimism or my realism. My attitude of gratitude is because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and Christians are thankful. Let's be honest, we live in a world that sets itself up against being grateful. We live in a world that's getting worse, not better. And that's the reality. For some, they become cynical and bitter and withdrawn. But for me, I see it as opportunity for a light to shine in a dark world. So we can look around and curse the darkness or we as Christians can say, thank you, God, you've given an opportunity for this light of the gospel to be seen in a way that perhaps it's never been seen before. When you go through adversity in life and difficult circumstances and everyone expects you 
to curse God and to die, but yet you hang on to faith and you have an attitude of gratitude and thanks, even though it defies human logic, the world around you can see the reality of the gospel in ways that they can't see it when everything's going your way. Being thankful is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's choice. And we're thankful because God is all powerful and controls the billions of contingencies in life to bring about his plan. That he knows everything. He doesn't have to learn. Nothing's being revealed to him. He's not figuring things out. And that through the Holy Spirit, God demonstrates the fact that he is everywhere by allowing the Holy Spirit to come and to live within us at the point in time of our salvation and never to leave us until we die and go to heaven and experience God in a whole different way. And I think maybe if we refocus and reshape the way that, that we've been viewing gratitude, it may be empowering or, or freeing for some. I was talking to a really good friend yesterday and um, some really bad things have happened. He made some mistakes, probably mostly his fault. Um, maybe not all of his fault. He was having a really hard time getting through the mistakes, getting through the, the bad things that have happened. Many of you have had a lot of bad things that have happened. As a matter of fact, as you age, now, probably all of us have had difficult things that have happened in our lives. If you haven't, you're either very unusual or you're very young. And as we were talking, I was empathetic and listening because these were really hard things. And I didn't want to be judgmental and I didn't want to be dismissive. Each of us have our own thing and it's huge to us, even if somebody else doesn't understand. But it occurred to me that when we allow the things that have happened in our past, whether we caused them or they were done to us, to trap us in the past, that an attitude of entitlement can slip in in this subtle idea that God has mistreated me and not given me what I deserve will allow a chip on our shoulder to begin to form. And that chip can start really small but can begin to grow to the point where it blinds us from seeing the reality of the world around us, God's blessing in our lives, and the fact that he has a future planned for us. And it's pretty hard to say, God, thank you for the terrible things that happened in my life. But you can say thank you for a number of reasons. And one is that you're here. You, my friend, have made it through and you didn't make it through with your own strength, God gave you the strength to make it through. You have another chance because you woke up this morning to serve the Lord, to love him, to impact the people in your life for the good and to nudge them toward the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. You have a future and God has a plan for your future where you're necessary, critically important to leave a mark on this world that nobody else can leave. And if you allow yourself to get trapped in the past because of real things that have happened, really bad things, and those things cause a sense of entitlement and mistreatment and the chip begins to grow, we can never really say thank you. What I said to my friend who I love and care about is congratulations, you're human. And one of the things that unites us as humans is sin and suffering. But God is bigger. And regardless or because of what we've been through, we can still say thank you. If you die, you still will live. Thank you. God holds the power to change everything in your life through a person or a circumstance or a miracle. And because of that, I say thank you. I'm not thankful because God does everything I want him to do when I want him to do it. I'm thankful because God is who he is and he's chosen to love me 
and he's chosen to love you even though we find ourselves most unlovable. And that, my friends, is grace. And for God's grace and mercy, I am thankful. Very good. So let's end the way we begin. Let's say, and you can say it toward me, not to me. Let's say thank you. Now let's get it right this time. I'll count to three. Are you ready? I'm going to say one, two, three. And then you're going to say thank you to God. And then this week, I want you to live it. I want you to go to the notes this week on your PDF file. You've got a Psalm that David wrote. It's from the message paraphrase that I included in your notes. Um, You'll see reasons David was thankful. I listed about seven different Psalms that remind us of things to be thankful for. But I wanna count to three. I want us to say, thank you. But I want you to go this week and to live thank you. And I know we can do it. Are you ready? One, two, three. Thank you, God. Now let's sing it to the Lord and tell him on our way out. Let's stand and sing. Thank you, guys.